Hi, this is Richard Garriott. I'm the executive producer of Tabula Rasa, and with me today is Paul Sage, who's the lead designer. And uh, today we're going to be showing you a little bit about the details of Tabula Rasa. I'd like to begin by giving you a little bit of the backstory of Tabula Rasa. Uh, the story of Tabula Rasa begins in the very near future, where tragically I can inform you that the Earth is going to be invaded by an evil force that we call the Bane. And when the Bane arrive here on Earth, they're going to overwhelm the vast majority of Earth defenses. But fortunately, there's a few of us, you and me, and a lot of our friends who will survive. And uh, we will be able to take up arms and learn some very powerful uh, capabilities from an, another advanced alien culture who is going to teach us these capabilities and provide us with the technologies that we need to in order to ensure our own survival and travel from planet to planet and struggle for the survival of the remnants of humanity. Where we're starting today is we're actually on a planet that we call Phoreus. Uh, we're actually fairly deep into the planet of Phoreus right now in, our, in today's demonstration. However, uh, kinder, gentler area of Phoreus is uh, where most uh, players will begin their lives. Uh, we'll also be starting with a second planet known as Ariki that we'll be showing you a little bit later. One of the first key features to talk about in Tabula Rasa is what we call our tactical combat system. You know, in most uh, MMOs, uh, combat is uh, what I consider fairly plotting, almost a turn-based whack-a-mole is what I often refer to it as, where uh, the server uh, gives you a synchronized attack uh, and uh, whoever does the most damage over time uh, prevails uh, at the end of combat. In Tabula Rasa, we've created something we think is much more fast-paced, a single mouse click uh, instantly uh, fires a shot in the case of a left click or fires off a, a special ability that you may have picked up with your right mouse button. Uh, but more importantly, as opposed to just standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and see who dies first, uh, Tabula Rasa includes the ability for you to use cover and uh, crouch down uh, and do other things to affect the uh, probability of uh, people being able to hit you as well as your probability to uh, attack other opponents. And the result of that is that as opposed to just standing there uh, statically toe-to-toe -to -toe until one of you wins, uh, you're actually constantly having to uh, consider your 3D surroundings and uh, uh, find opportunities to uh, hide behind cover uh, but still see your opponents clearly. Uh, but conversely, they're going to try to work to a position where they have the ability to have that same advantage against you. Uh, and so therefore, in real time, as the battle uh, scenario unfolds uh, or the conditions unfold, uh, you'll have to modify uh, your behavior. Uh, similarly, uh, many of the creatures that we've put in the game uh, have AIs that we've developed to, again, uh, encourage the players to react to that AI in ways other than standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and firing. Uh, so, for example, these kale that uh, we see here, Paul fighting against, uh, they don't have any ranged attack of any kind. On the other hand, uh, if they manage to close to hand-to-hand -to -hand range, uh, they have a very devastating uh, set of attacks. And what that means is that as opposed to uh, player groups keeping their uh, normal group uh, in a, a fighting stance where they might have their tankers up front and their uh, more ranged uh, weapon users in the rear, uh, when a Kale invades your group, uh, even those tankers will have a hard time uh, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. So we'll tend to have a, the, the advance of the Kale tends to uh, have a scattering effect uh, on any party that might be facing them where everybody basically retreats as fast as they can uh, in order to keep at a ranged uh, distance from those kale and hope to take it down before uh, the kale managed to close that gap. Another thing we're, uh, that I think is uh, quite interesting to talk about uh, in the way that we handle the environments for Tabula Rasa is that in most MMOs uh, the games are quite static. Uh, creatures spawn in various areas uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure that when players of a certain level are looking for creatures to kill of a certain level, they can find the sufficient uh, quantity of creatures to go farm for experience points uh, and equipment. Uh, in Tabula Rasa, we've done something we think is much more interesting and much more sophisticated, uh, where uh, the creatures, as they spawn into our world, uh, don't just merely respawn where they were. They actually commonly have uh, tactical uh, or strategic objectives on the main battlefields that they are trying to uh, uh, reach, to take over, and then ultimately to hold and resist against the other factions. And so even with no real humans uh, playing Tabula Rasa, the game is effectively constantly battling itself, where the AIs that represent the human NPCs are trying to defend, hold, and acquire territory against the Bane forces, uh, who conversely are trying to uh, wipe out and take over uh, these same uh, strategic locations across these battlefields. 
And the result of that is, is that when players come back into the game, uh, they will find that uh, uh, the battlefields have often changed substantially from the last time they've been here. For example, uh, you might go to one town and find, uh, uh, be given a series of missions to go accomplish that might take you out into these uh, regions that uh, might be under uh, one or the other factional control. Uh, the result, however, when you reach that area might be that this particular outpost that you might be sent to, uh, which normally would have available to you a, a hospital, a, uh, uh, a waypoint system for rapid transit, uh, it might have a crafting station to be able to uh, create uh, and craft various items. Uh, it might have uh, outer defenses, not only a wall to protect the peat yourself and others within, the, within that town, force fields, uh, but also automatic defenses, things like turrets and other ways that kind of protect that region of the game. Um, however, if the Bane overrun that, all those services go offline. And so none of those are available to you or other players until either the NPCs or what will I think be more generally the case, a group of humans, of real human players, uh, get together a sufficient uh, uh, capability uh, to go and retake and hold that uh, strategic uh, outpost. Another interesting feature about Tabula Rasa is the way we deal with our storylines. In most MMOs, the stories are there really as a, uh, uh, a, a casual excuse, you might say, to drive you through uh, the leveling process, to keep moving you through the game into the additional levels of difficulty uh, that the game might uh, have uh, in creature difficulty as they spread across the map. Uh, in Tabula Rasa, we've made our stories far more important. They, uh, uh, you need to pay much closer attention to what you're doing in our stories. Uh, and our stories often culminate in these experiences inside of private instance spaces where we can control the circumstances of your mission much more carefully and we've created very climactic scripted events that often result in the destruction or collapse of entire complexes of the enemy forces. Uh, and so we think that that represents a much bigger payoff to the player for their participation in these kinds of spaces. Another thing we do with our uh, missions and stories, which is quite different than other MMOs, is what we call broadly ethical parables. In our missions, uh, the players are commonly asked to do things uh, where one group might give them one set of instructions as, or one set of objectives to go accomplish. But they'll meet another faction within our game, another friendly faction, but they will have uh, d a different agenda or a different methodology or a different long-term goal than that first faction. And so the missions that they might be, provi be provided, uh, for the, they might provide for the player, will not necessarily be mutually compatible with that first set of missions. And the player will then have to start making judgment calls as to which group to support and which group to either ignore or commonly uh, work against uh, as they proceed through, the, through our game. And the result of that will be that the uh, player, first of all, will need to start paying much more close attention to what it is that they're doing, uh, but then they'll also have to live with the ramifications of the decisions they make as to what friends uh, they may have, uh, or what groups they may have alienated, and what groups now might consider you their friend. One of the last uh, main areas we commonly talk about in Tabula Rasa is the way we deal with our character class growth. Uh, in most MMOs, the first decision you make is what class you wish to be, and that's a permanent decision you make uh, forevermore with that character. And if you want to explore another class, uh, you have to end up starting the game over, basically, with a new character at all the way back to the beginning at level one, which we think uh, is a, a, a major obstacle to players uh, choosing to explore the wide variety of content that we have. In Tabula Ross, we've done a much, uh, quite a bit different uh, uh, process. Uh, we have every character start as a recruit, and once you've started playing the game, after a few levels, you can decide whether you wish to be, in our case, uh, either a soldier or a specialist. Uh, in this case, Paul's character has chosen to be a specialist. Uh, ten levels later, he, that specialist can decide whether they want to be a sapper or a biotechnician. In, the, in Paul's case, he's chosen to be a sapper. And 15 levels after that, his sapper gets to choose whether he wants to be an engineer or the demolitionist. And in this case, uh, Paul has chosen to be an engineer. Uh, since your character slowly specializes over time, another thing we've done is we've coupled this feature with the ability to load and save and clone your characters. Uh, and so, for example, anytime Paul wants to, he can actually shell out to the, uh, 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 to the login screen here. 
uh, where he can select uh, the character we were just using, Lewis, uh, and he can choose to clone it. Uh, he uh, gets another uh, a, a duplicate of Lewis that he can give a new uh, name, in this case, Fred. Uh, Fred uh, may, might be, uh, might be a, a woman here, so now it's Frederina. Uh, he can again change uh, the physical attributes of this uh, particular character. Uh, but then when he's done with uh, uh, changing this character out, he just accepts that change, and now he has a level 50 engineer clone, uh, Frederina, who he's just created, who can now pick up right where that character was and continue playing the game. And this, we believe, will allow people to explore all of our class tree much more freely. Uh, so uh, since you'll be able to make a clone at each of those branches in our class tree, if you ever want to go back and explore the other branch, you never have to start all the way over at level one. You only have to start over at the most recent tier that you've crossed uh, and just start with the clone and move on down that other branch. Uh, so we think that's actually very good for the players and frankly good for us as content creators because it means uh, uh, players, I think, will enjoy and be able to move much more freely through all the content we've created. And as creators, we want people to see and appreciate all the content that we've uh, you know, obviously worked hard to create.